All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 28th day of August in the year of our Lord, 2023. Uh, I would like to talk, again, I'm often on this subject, but there is a confusion in this world that Satan loves. It is the confusion between those who are truly the children of God and those who think they're the children of God or are called the children of God, referring to Christians. There is uh, real Christians. I think we have to use the term born-again, Bible-believing Christians. That's probably about as close as we can get without going into a paragraph long descriptions. Uh, Because you must be born again. And if you are born again, you'll love the Bible. You'll love Christ. You'll seek to to walk in obedience to him. The, the new birth, that, that which is begotten of God in you. But we have this confusion. I'm not going to go into the internal confusion right now, but I'll simply refer you to Paul's epistle to the Romans when he talks about the conflict within us between the spirit and the flesh, the new man, the old man, between Christ and Adam. Uh, What we came into this world with, which is the flesh, that which is born of Adam, uh, fallen man. We were born fallen, without God in us, which I believe that is the essence of what is called original sin. That is not a biblical term. That is a theological term invented by people that maybe shouldn't be teaching. But uh, the sin sin that we're born with, you could say, uh, the consequences of Adam's disobedience and rebellion against God. He was cut off from God. He died spiritually. To be without God is to be spiritually dead. God is not, you're, uh, to be out of that relationship with God is to be spiritually dead. And to say Adam, although he was created to be the image of God, to refer to, to uh, fallen humanity as having the image of God, no, they have the, uh, the obligation to be the image of God. But you can't be the image of God without God in you. Excuse me. Uh, you cannot, as Jesus said, you cannot do any good thing apart from me. They are spiritually dead. I was spiritually dead. And they don't understand it. I didn't understand it. Uh, when I was in the Air Force, I'd been raised as a Lutheran, baptized as a Lutheran, confirmed as a Lutheran. But we're going to go to a verse shortly that I have to say I was not of God. I was of the world. I was a fallen son of Adam. And uh, manifestly so. And But then I was deceived. I was taught that I would go to heaven because I had been baptized as an infant. Sprinkled. Uh, and I, I, and as a Lutheran, of course, Luther was strong on salvation by faith alone. And there's this, this schizophrenia, this uh, double-mindedness. It's probably better than trying to use one of these worldly, goofy things. Double-mindedness, to use a scriptural term, in Lutheranism, 
about salvation by grace through faith in Christ and sacramentalism, infant baptism, born again by being sprinkled as an infant apart from any personal faith. It's just, just it's there and it's very confusing and we find these things in a lot of things. The, the sacramentalism in uh, conservative denominations is it's this inconsistency. It's not consistent with the Word of God, but it's tradition. It's of the world. It's of fallen man. It's not of God. God did not teach these things in the Scriptures. If the Scriptures don't teach it, you don't have to believe it. People tell you you have to believe it, but no, you don't. And that is my answer to... You know, no matter what denomination or what group it is, they'll have some things that are not biblical, but do not stand up to biblical examination. And I say, if 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 God didn't plainly teach it in the scriptures, I don't have to believe it. They can't really answer that. <clears throat> if they're born again, they'll say, "Yeah, you're probably right." They'll recognize, hopefully they'll recognize they have traditions that aren't really biblical. Everybody does. And, and on top of that, we have this confusion. To confuse something is to, to bind together or weld together a con with fuse, weld, uh, things that shouldn't be welded together. And they won't stay together. Like if you try to weld aluminum to, to steel or something like that, it's not going to work. I mean, you may get it to stick for a while, but it will break. It, it's got no, there's no strength. There's it, it, they can't be joined together properly by by welding. It just doesn't work. Uh, so somebody out there will probably think it. Well, if you use the right rod, you can do it. Uh, okay, I'm trying to do an illustration here. <laughs> The, the, the uh, precisionist and I of that a little bit so okay so I, I, I need to remind everybody to start with what Jesus said to man a noted rabbi a teacher of Israel a member of the ruling body of God's people and that man named Nicodemus in John chapter 3 so let's go over there briefly, and this just is just a way of reminder, so we have this as a background, as God's background. And we can't, if we don't understand this, we can't understand anything. And you can't really understand this unless you've experienced it. I mean, you can doctrinally, but it, you don't know it because you haven't, if you haven't, it hasn't happened to you. It's like when I was in the Air Force, guy asked me, are you born again? I did not know what he was talking about. I said, well, I've been baptized and confirmed. He sort of realized I wasn't born again. I was reading the Bible, that's why he asked the question. John chapter 3, verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, a member of the Sanhedrin, like a senator, approximately, with no king. Pilate was the actual ruler. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, or that could be more literally translated from above, he cannot see the kingdom of the God. Of God, he cannot perceive the kingdom of God. I want to point out right here: you have a a, a very important Jewish teacher who is a member of the Sanhedrin comes to Jesus and 
acknowledges that he's a teacher come from God who does genuine miracles and that God is with him. And Jesus immediately says to him, that's not enough. See, faith that Jesus is a teacher come from God does not save you. He immediately put his finger on something. Unless, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he's old? Good question. This is a rhetorical question. <clears throat> Nicodemus is not ignorant. Nicodemus is asking Jesus for clarification. I don't understand. Except a uh, can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and, uh, and be born? Again, this is a rhetorical question. He doesn't, he knows Jesus doesn't literally mean this. He's really saying, I really don't understand you. Please clarify. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born, this is a clarification, of water, literally out of water, I want to say make something clear here too. Born out of water, in the original language, in the Greek, and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You must be born again. You must be born of God. You must be born of the Spirit. Everyone is born out of water. That's the natural birth. That's the first birth. We come into this world born out of water. When a woman gives is about to give birth, what's the first sign that birth is imminent? She'll say, my water burst. When we're in the womb, we're surrounded by water that's very much like seawater, the, the embryonic fluid. And we're born out of that environment into this world. That's the, the first birth. And, and Jesus makes it perfectly clear, a uh, typical Hebraic fashion. He says the same thing in two different ways to make it clear, because Nicodemus is asked for a clarification. Except a man be born out of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. You're outside the kingdom of God. You're an alien to God's kingdom. That which is born of flesh, out of water, of flesh. See, here's that's why that uh, that is not referring to baptism. It's referring to natural birth, because Jesus is saying the same thing in a different way. It's typical Jewish. You see this in the in the uh, Psalms all the time. A repetition using different words. That which is born of flesh, this is natural man, Adam, fallen mankind, is flesh. When Paul talks about the flesh, that's what he's talking about. What we get from Adam by natural birth. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. You have to be born again because you do not come into this world with the Spirit of God. You are devoid of the Spirit of God. All you have is the flesh of fallen man, of Adam, fallen Adam. Marvel not that I said unto thee, you must, ye must be born again. And then he goes on to say, Nick Damas, how come you don't understand this? But this is Jesus. And we, of course, we quote this chapter all the time, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believeth in him 
shall have eternal shall not perish but have eternal life jesus precedes this with this with saying though you must be born again it's absolutely essential you cannot enter god's kingdom unless you're born again and that's only that's something only god can do No church can give you the new birth. No man can give you the new birth. God must do it. The Spirit of God. You must be begotten of God. And most of what's called Christianity believes the priest can do that by sprinkling you with water. Apart from any kind of faith on your part. Because you're nothing but an infant. They'll try to justify that. But if you can't show that Scripture teaches it, it doesn't come from God. God doesn't have a problem explaining things. We just have a problem listening to Him. That is the background. Now I want to go to another verse. Again, we're talking about what is real Christianity and the confusion in this world about that. I know that's something that's always troubled me, is where do you draw the line between who's a Christian and who's not? Where does God draw the line? That's the question. Where did Jesus draw the line? Are you born again? If not, you're not in his kingdom. 1 John chapter 2. John, who wrote this book, that you might know that you have eternal life. In other words, he, he goes through this book and he's, he's uh, talking about who's a Christian and who's not. Are you really saved? And he gives a bunch of uh, criteria that you could measure yourself by. One of the most important ones, do you love the brethren? those who are genuinely Christians, who are born again. Do you love them? You're only brethren if you've been born again. Because then you, you, you are born of God, and you have the same, at Christ is your, your fellowship. And you have the love of the Father poured out in you. It's from Him. It's from the new creation. It's God's work. We are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus. The new creation. And while we're in this mortal body, we have this confusion within ourselves because we are both of Adam in our body, our flesh, and we're of, of God in our spirits. And the Holy Spirit dwells in us. And this confusion could not exist except for the cross. There is no way the Spirit of God could dwell in us if we were simple, simply sinners. So it's not biblically correct, nor, the, nor does the Bible do this, to refer to the saints, the redeemed, those who have been born again, as sinners. Because we don't practice sin. Uh, there's something particularly unique, uh, well, particularly common in the Greek language that isn't in the English and is difficult to translate uh, without being a little clumsy. And it's, it is a, a verb that becomes a noun. It's like, in English, it's approximately those who believe, or the believers. So this is a, a noun that describes something that is a an attribute of what you're talking about. So people that believe in God, the, the faith as an attribute, as something that is inherent in them, not just something that comes and goes, but something that describes what they are. A believer in Christ, as, as that's what they are, not just an incidental thing. Like, the, the hat they, they might have on their head. Something that can be taken off and put on. No, it's something that's inherent 
to their character and their nature. And you you can't have that unless you're born again. And so that in that context, let's look at this. First John, so he's, he's saying here, uh, this is another thing that separates true Christians from people that might be called Christians or might believe they're Christians, <clears throat> but they're not. That's where a lot of confusion comes in, even among Christians. Am I really a Christian or not? Read First John. It, it's not a matter of our works. Has God done these things in you? A lot of people read First John and say, well, I, I have to do these things to be to inherit eternal life. No, the purpose of First John is to say, has ask the question, has God done these things in you? Have you been born again? That's what First John's about. How do I know? So you read First John. It's like Jesus said, um, if you love me, if in other words, if you truly love me, you will keep my commandments. Keeping the commandments doesn't make us love God. The fact that we love God or love Christ causes us to keep his commandments. Not Moses' commandments here. This is his commandments. Love one another. That's his great commandment. Love one another. Love your brethren. Love your fellow Christians, true Christians. That love will be in you if you are born again, because it's a gift from God, along with eternal life, a free gift from God. It's not something you create. It's something God puts in you. It's a new creation. But it's in a body of flesh, sinful flesh. We have this treasure, Paul says, in earthen vessels while we're in this earth during this time. And it's confusing because we have the old man, as Paul uses it, uh, describes it in one place or several places, and the new. And they are wrestling with each other for supremacy. As Paul describes in, in detail, in length in his epistle to the Romans. Do not love the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Again, First John is so the people may know whether or not they're truly a Christian of Christ, born again. If any man loves the world or the things of the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The love that belong, that comes from the Father, the Father is poured out in us. So this is a result. Not loving the world and loving God is a result of the new birth. For all that is in the world, this is, this is not the world of John 3.16. That is God's created arrangement of things as he created it. God so loved that world, his creation, which includes man, of course, that he gave his only begotten son, not just to redeem man, but also a creation itself, which has suffered the consequences of man's sin. Scripture plainly teaches, teaches that. Paul teaches that. The creation groans, eagerly awaiting the unveiling of the sons of God, which happens at the return of Christ, when we are seen as we truly are, and we become uh, glorified, what we are saved to be, truly the, the manifest children of God, seen for what God has made us, his workmanship. He gets the glory. We can't take, take glory. We can't transform ourselves into something good. Fallen humanity is helpless. The most we can do is, 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 is uh, fallen 
human beings is under the conviction of the Holy Spirit, confronted with our dilemma and the ugliness of ourselves, cry out to God to save us from ourselves. It's not something not some Christians say, well, God saved me from hell. Well, did God save you from yourself? I mean, that's why do you go to hell? Because of what you are. We have to be saved from ourselves. And in this world, when we're born again, we have the the first and great installment of that, really. We just we just continue to dwell in these old tents, these old bodies, uh, veiled, just like if Jesus was veiled, except his flesh was not sinful, but he was took on human flesh. God in human flesh. God Almighty walked among us, and they didn't recognize him. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is of the world. <coughs> and, mm, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> oh, Got to turn the uh, air filter on in here or something. Oh yeah, my air exchange fan is not. Got to turn that timer back on. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. Yes, this age. Let's, let me verify that. Oh, it's cosmos. But yes, th this this is not the world of John three sixteen again. This is the world that is the product of fallen man and Satan. That's why Satan's called the god of this age, because he is the father of Adam's rebellion and Adam's fall, and that Adam chose to follow Satan rather than God. And that resulted in the catastrophe of the fall. And Jesus had to die on a cross to to purchase redemption, to pay the penalty for our sin, for the sins of the world, in order that we could enter a proper relationship with God. The Holy Spirit could never come into us unless our sins were fully atoned for. God will not abide with sin. Our, the only reason we can have the Holy Spirit dwelling in us is because Christ died on that cross. And his resurrection proves he comp accomplished that atonement. That is the proof God has given to all men. The resurrection. The world passeth away. That This arrangement of things of Adam and fallen man and Satan. And the lust thereof, the desires thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Let's go to one last verse to clarify that, because some people, well, what, what must I do to do the will of God? Well, some Pharisees asked Jesus that question. And he says this in John chapter 6, Labor not for the meat or food that perisheth, but for the meat food that endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for he hath, for him God uh, the Father hath sealed. God the Father hath sealed. Then, verse 28, they said unto him, what shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that you believe on him whom he hath sent. 
believe on Christ. Faith in Christ. We're saved by the grace, the gift, the free gift of God alone. Through faith alone, in Christ alone. Not of ourselves, of him. Okay, so back to, uh, to John there. Love not the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Before I was born again, I did not have any love for God. I knew I was supposed to. I might say I love you. I would pray, but it was always self-centered. I was self-centered. That's what the children of Adam are by nature, because God is not in them. To me, God was out there someplace. Not in here. Not in me. I was not his. I did not belong to God. I was a sinner. I practiced sin. I did not love God. I considered myself a Christian, a Lutheran, to be more precise. But I wasn't even good at that. I wasn't interested. I was interested in, here I'm, you know, uh, 18, 19, 20 years old. And I'm interested in me and my life and what I'm going to do. Love not the world nor, nor the things of this world this arrangement, and we come in of the world, fallen children of Adam, and we create, we help create this mess that is referred to as the word world, arrangement of things. We seek to find our place in it. And none of it's from God. It's all about us. If we're honest, it's all about us. When we do good things, it's because it makes us feel good. It feels good sometimes to do a good thing. And people will, will engage in charity and everything else for a number of reasons, but one of it is that it makes them feel good. But that is not acceptable to God. It's because it's it's self motivated, it's selfish. Self that's probably so, the selfish is not quite the word. Self centered. It comes out of Adam. And it's all everything we do is truly self centered. It's in relate we do things in relation to ourself. And what makes me feel good? That's the flesh. So, and Christianity rapidly began to be polluted by people that were not regenerate. And often would fool even the apostles. Simon the magician, uh, he was baptized. He saw the miracles and uh, after Pentecost, and, and then he comes. Uh, his, his, his trade was magic and, you know, basically deception. And does signs and wonders, supposedly. How, whatever those were does not, is not important. But he, he sees the apostles doing these, these real miracles. And he's impressed, and he... he believes, according to the scripture, and is baptized, 
And then he comes to Peter and says, sell me the power to give the Holy Spirit to whoever I desire. What was his motivation? Well, Peter saw what it was. Obviously, given his past, he probably wants to sell, you know, he can sell the Holy Spirit, make a fortune. Sell it, sell it. He's a merchant, uh, uh, a merchant of, of miracles. We have an overdose of those today. Kenneth Copeland, to name one well-known scoundrel. Send me money and I'll sell you. You'll, you can buy God's blessing from me. And some even more blatant than him. Making merchandise out of God. Of course, they're fraudsters because they don't possess God at all. There's enemies. And Peter's response was what? He essentially told Peter, in modern English, to go to hell. Or, uh, Nick, um, Simon the Magician. Peter said, may your money perish with you. You and your money can go to hell. Because that's, that is ruin. That is destruction. That is the eternal penitentiary or landfill of God. Gehenna. The dump where they burned all the garbage with perpetual burning because the flames were always going on. The old dumps, the old city dumps used to be like that. And they stunk. A putrefaction, everything. That's, that's Gehenna, Jesus' picture of hell because the city dump of Jerusalem was to the west in the valley of Gehenna. Well, they dumped all the refuge, the dung, dead carcasses, waste, and burned it. It was always burning, always stinking. Everything that is unsuitable for God's kingdom will be removed to that place. Simon the Magician. Obviously, he had been baptized in water, but he was not born again because Peter said, I see what's in your heart. It was not right. He was not saved. He had the heart of the sinner. Water doesn't do it. Born out of water is the natural birth. That's what's in John chapter 3. It's not water baptism. It's on, in your face evident if you... If you if, but, but because we've been indoctrinated into man's doctrines, it's hard for us to see because we have to break free of the bondage to human teaching that's not taught in the Scripture. And that doesn't happen instantly. Renewing your mind. Do not be conformed to the world, but renew your mind. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. By God's word. By the Spirit of God. So, what I want to talk about is this, this confusion, not only that's in us, between the flesh and the Spirit, and new believers often, you know, how can I, how can I be a, a, a child of God, be filled with the Spirit, that, that been born again, and do some of the things that I do? Well, Paul answers that question. He says he's got the same problem. We are still in the flesh. We are this new creature of God, begotten of the Father. But we are still dwell in these mortal bodies in which sin dwells. The sin of Adam is still with us and in us. We're, we're, we're stuck in this temporary situation 
until the redemption of our bodies, which occurs not when we die. We are set free from our... When you die, you're set free from that from, uh, because your body dies. But the, the, uh, the glorification, the redemption of our bodies occurs at the, at the, the resurrection and rapture depending whether you're, you're, you've passed away or you're alive at that time, uh, which should be happening fairly soon, <laughs> given, given the circumstances and the signs. The major signs that Jesus and Paul gives, the explosion of lawlessness and uh, the, the uh, major decline in the love of Christians uh, toward God, the apostasy is taking place before our eyes rapidly. Look at the explosion of lawlessness in the American government at various levels and everywhere. From the streets, the cities are disintegrating. L.A., you can see it on YouTube, people that go back and show their old neighborhoods. The, the endless homelessness in places like Seattle, Los Angeles, San Francisco, New York, but usually out there because the weather's more temperate. Uh, uh, so ten, the, the homeless tend to move toward areas that have lots of benefits and they won't freeze. And that is, they're not stupid. <laughs> they're farming the system. It's, it's a lifestyle more than anything else. They're usually addicted. And they don't want to work. <laughs> I, I'm not, I have a lot of experience in that area with, with people and, and trying to help them. I, I did that for quite a few years. And I've come to the conclusion, unless God helps them, don't bother. Don't bother, you know. Give them a New Testament. But they won't understand it. <laughs> That's not what they want. They don't really want to be free from that. They like the party and they like the sex. They like the drugs. They like the lawlessness. They're children of fallen children of Adam, just like everybody else. And the only way they can be saved is they have to be born again. They have to get a new life. And that can't come from human beings. It can't come from counseling. It can't come from pills. It has to come from God. And unless, you know, until the Holy Spirit convicts someone of what they truly are and their, how wicked they really are, until they realize they really deserve hell, of conviction of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment. And even then, they can turn away. Why some don't turn away is a mystery. When others do. We're all the, when we're all children, born children of Adam. It's a mystery. It's the same seed, the Word of God, but some of it just falls on prepared soil, and some of it falls on unprepared soil. That's you know Jesus' parable of the se the sower and the seeds. Who knows? God knows. But Christians, Christianity, the vast majority of Christ people that think they're Christians or are called Christians are not born again. They're not of God. They, they do not have the Spirit of God dwelling in them. It is the Christian world that Satan and man built. And it was, you've got unregenerate people among the saints maybe the children of the saints at times, maybe strangers like like uh, Simon the magician that is impressed and, 
and uh, they're they're uh, drawn by all kinds of factors, but they have not come to truly saving faith. They have not been truly born again. Uh, and because we we dwell in with, with sinful bodies, it's hard for the saints to tell. Because all of us still have sin dwelling in us. But there is a complete difference. And what happened apparently is throughout Christian history, more and more people uh, began to enter the church and the church became more of a an institution and you had the development of the sacraments the sacraments allow unsaved people to think they're saved because they think it that salvation see this is what how natural man thinks unregenerate man looks at the visible he cannot see the kingdom of god so they they look at they looked at baptism and saw this thing that you can see and said ah that's how you become a christian and some Christians who were sometimes confused the issue more and gave that impression. They may be talking spiritually, uh, but they gave, you know, they tended to give an impression that the, getting baptized is what saves you. Today we have dom many, many denominations that believe that as, a, as the truth. But this gradually developed over time. There was no infant baptism in the beginning, no record of it anywhere. And th these things developed, and it was with human reasoning and increasing numbers of unsaved people uh, as priests, the priesthood developed, that wasn't original, and bishops and, and uh, teachers in the church that weren't regenerate. And the worldly people in the church loved them because... Well, birds of a feather flock together. And the church became more and more corrupt until the time of Constantine, where the church wedded the world. And then soon after that, the uh, you had state Christianity. And Roman Catholicism is like an abandoned branch of state Christianity, the Christianity of the West. Uh, it was just sort of left to itself. And... You had to the papacy and all this stuff. This, this is of the flesh. It's manifestly so of the flesh. Today there was there was a schism in 1054, I believe it was, between the East and the West, between uh, Constantinople and the Orthodox, uh, the Orthodox Christ, uh, Catholic Church, and in the West you had the Roman Catholic Church, and men of filled with themselves, filled with flesh, absolutely unregenerate. Uh, representing one church and the other, both uh, jointly excommunicated each other. <laughs> there was a spiritual gunfight, and they both died. Uh, <laughs> shoot out at OK Corral. Uh, okay Corral. Uh, but, yeah, they just excommunicated everybody in that under those umbrellas. That's called the Great Schism. There's another schism today in process over there uh, between the Patriarch of Constantinople, the Ghost Church of Constantinople, because uh, the the Muslims captured Constantinople, the the center of Eastern Christianity, in 1453. And it fell finally. It, the 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 Byz what we call the Byzantine Empire, the Roman Empire, that Byzantine is a Roman Empire, kept shrinking, 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 shrinking under Muslim pressure. And then finally, uh, the uh, uh, the Ottoman Turks, the Muslims uh, from uh, the Turks, captured uh, the fortress of Constantinople, the city of Constantinople, on the that is today in Istanbul, on the. This, this, in the Straits there of Bosphorus, between the Black Sea and the uh, Mediterranean Sea, present-day Turkey. 
and that was they, they converted the uh, the the Church of Holy Wisdom, uh, the big huge dome, uh, bigger than anything in the Vatican, I think, to a mosque, and it remained so until. Uh, the revolution, the secular revolution in Turkey after World War I, uh, and, but it's been converted back now to a mosque. It was converted to a museum. Uh, but that, that, that was not truly Christianity. It was a system that was a result of the flesh. You can have people that are in that system that are called uh, properly Orthodox Catholics. Uh, the Orthodox Catholic Church, as opposed to the Roman Catholic Church, that's technically what they called. And uh, that was a system of state religion. And it is today you have the Russian Orthodox Church and the Greek Orthodox Church and uh, the... Um, Bulgarian Orthodox Church, and so you have state churches, just like in Europe. Uh, most of them have ceased now, but you had state-supported and state-controlled. The uh, uh, Lutheran, the Norwegian Lutheran Church, is state religion. You had uh, the, the Evangelical Church of uh, of Germany, which was. Bismarck created a hybrid, joined by edict the uh, Reformed and Lutherans together. You, so all these countries had state churches. That's not Christianity. It is an outer visible shell uh, that has some Christian elements in it, but it is not salvific Christianity. They can still preach the gospel. And there's remembrances of what Christ did there, but the structures claim to be able to save you, and they can't. It's it's not true Christianity. There can be true Christians among them. If you're born again, you're a true Christian. If you're not, you're not a Christian. And if you love the world and the things of the world, that's evidence that you're not a Christian. You haven't received the love poured out by the Father within you. Again, read First John. Um, but don't think it's by your works. It's, it's Has God done these things in you? Not in your flesh, because it hasn't been glorified yet, but in the Spirit. Is that new creation in you? If it's not, you're not saved. And because the flesh cannot perceive the kingdom of God, people that are not born again, that are in the churches among us, always push things toward the world because they love the world and the things of the world. They, 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 they have no possibility. That's the, the potential to love God is not in them if they're not born again. They cannot love God. Not in truth. The Spirit of God does not dwell in them. So they, they do not understand these things and they... Going by what they see, they create these things that they can see and feel and touch and are comfortable with of the world. A lot of the things that, that please that Christians do in churches and bring about in churches are things pleasing to the flesh. Programs that are pleasing to the flesh. Because that's all they know. And they, they, they get, the, to them, people joining the church is salvation. People getting baptized in water is salvation. Rather than a testimony that they have been saved. Rome, it's a church of flesh. The glorification of man's religion. The glorification of, of the Pope. The, the Vatican is not about Jesus Christ. It's to the glory of man, to the glory of the, the papacy. It was not built in obedience to God. 
not his church. Doesn't mean all Roman Catholics are unsaved. But they're only saved if they're truly born again. But for a born-again Christian to remain in some of these man-made churches is, what are you doing? <laughs> Maybe it's just because they don't know anything else. But the, the flesh want, wants to stay. And we have that struggle within us that confusion within us. <sighs> Come quickly, Lord Jesus. But that's, that's what I wanted to talk about, that today, if you look at what's called Christianity, it's not. And it doesn't matter, you know, you, you have fundamentalist Baptists, which are probably the closest thing you're going to find to biblical Christianity. Uh, they still hold to a somewhat of a biblical worldview where the world is not of God. They, they still hold to some of these scriptures that are very important. Uh, some of that's diminishing because the flesh wants to be comfortable in the world. And it's not going to be comfortable, you know, in uh, Christians can't be comfortable in the world. They can't seek the things of this world. They can't love the things of this world. If that's what you're about, know that you're not saved. Your flesh loves those things. Your flesh desires those things. It will, uh, that which is, comes from Adam, because that's what it is. The world system is from that. But you look at Christians that are all into politics, all into this, all into that, trying to fix the world. Well, they're deceived. They're not doing the will of God. They're doing what they want to do. Because they love the world. So they want to fix the world. Biblical Christians, born-again Christians, know that the world is passing away. Know that you cannot fix it. We're called to preach the gospel that people might be saved out of the world onto Christ, into the kingdom of God. Anything else is a deception. All these denominational systems are deceptions. God didn't build them. They're in, they're in violation of God's explicit commandments. And even even among fundamental independent Baptists, which I, I, I think are the most biblical, but there are bad things that are among them frequently. Unregenerate people like Stephen L. Anderson. Haters, people that just, they, they hate the world in a carnal way. And they're self-centered, and they're they're just they're looking for themselves. And they're a reproach to Christ. And people like that have always been with the church. False brethren. Uh, Satan dis. dis Servants of Satan that put on wool or sheep's clothing. They pretend to be Christians. And they not only deceive others, but they deceive themselves. They're not born again. You must be born again to behold the kingdom of God, to see it, to perceive it, to enter it. That's the difference. Are you a born-again Christian or not? Born again according to the scriptures. Not according to your 
tradition. Without that, you don't belong to Christ. God has not begotten you. It's not a doctrine. It's a fact, a reality, a new birth, born from above. There's just so much confusion. And if we can't see things the way the scripture presents them, see the reality that's here, we will be deceived. We have enemies in this age that want to destroy us, want to deceive us. Some of them are human and some of them aren't. The world, do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Remember that. Make sure you are in Christ. Read First John. Don't be deceived. Do you belong to Christ? Has he truly saved you? And remember, you're still in an unredeemed body, so do you truly love God? Do you truly love your brethren, those who are born again? Because if they're not born again, they're not your brethren. They're of the world, not of God. And this is a hard thing to talk about because as I was... I didn't understand. Unless you have been born again, you cannot really understand what I'm saying. If you have been born again, you will understand what I'm saying. Because Christ is in you. And that's why we're brethren. We're born of one Father. 